Gigi, what about you? What's your view on independence and their role in Parliament? Well, I wouldn't just say independents are potentially important this election, but anybody who's not one of the major parties. And, mm. and the reason is I very much agree with the blokes on either side that diversity is a source of strength in a democracy. And we've seen that in the most recent historical example of the last couple of years, when we've seen the most catastrophic betrayal of the Australian people in terms of poor health policy management that I've ever seen in Australia. I think that we've seen for a generation, and we're going to be carrying the cost of that for a generation. And that's down to both major parties and their supporters, the Greens and the Nationals. Sorry, gentlemen. And so I think that you know, the obvious thing to do is to put everybody else first and the four, two majors and two supporting people last on the ballot because Saturday is the Australian people's opportunity to pay back for the betrayals of the last two years. And it'll be the independents and it'll be the, all the what we call freedom-friendly minor parties. So UAP, IMOP, Australian Federation Party, all these other ones, they've all been popping up for a very good reason, which is that people who think that a monoculture and a single way of doing things is the right approach have abused that power and have crushed people's dreams in this country and, and set us back hugely that we'll be feeling for a generation. We will be coming back to this issue. Gigi? I tend to agree. It's politically expedient to say this, of course. And this is what we see every election in Australia, right? What gets votes is someone who seems to be somewhat, uh, you know, self-deprecating and also appeals to the pocketbook of the voter. And I'm sure we'll be talking about those policy proposals right now. And they're pointing to things that are about the pocketbook. And they're trying to distract away from the real issue, which is that for the last two years, we've had mismanagement from both big parties. The Prime Minister claims that raising the minimum wage will cause economic damages and worsen inflationary pressures. Ms Foster, as an economist, what are your thoughts on this? Great question, and it is a very important one as we are now seeing finally some of the uh, longer term harvests of our COVID policy mismanagement. We've had inflation now at five and over 5%, and that is going, unfortunately, I believe, to continue. And the RBA is going to raise rates. It's going to be more difficult for people to pay their mortgages, and that's because the wages will not necessarily ratchet up at the same rate. Now, Going for minimum wage increases is one way to try to help people. Another way is to hope that the enterprise bargaining and the other kinds of uh, Fair Work Commission mediated sorts of uh, negotiations will uh, raise rates. And, and we actually should expect that because right now the labor side, not the labor side of politics, but the labor side of the labor market has a pretty powerful argument, which is, look, how are we going to afford for uh, you know, the, the things that we did before on the wages that we've, we've gotten now? We, need, we have the right to a contract at higher wage. However, if that happens, yes, it will be inflationary. That is just the, the case. And so what I fear we are headed towards, and it's something I've been speaking about for over a year now, is a kind of a stagflationary situation where we've got lower productivity and you know, we've got a lot of damage to Australia that we've got to clean up, and we also have rising prices. And so we're going to have recessionary conditions, a bear market. Um, you've seen stocks tumbling uh, overseas as well. Uh, it's, it's not a pretty time. A very interesting time to be an economist, but a very sad time to uh, have to live through and particularly as a young person. Um, so I, I do worry about it, but I feel for the labourers and I feel they have the right to ask for higher wages. Look, Gigi, to be fair to the PM, he does say he supports a minimum wage rise. His issue has been with the idea of a 5.1% minimum wage rise to keep up with um, inflation. The inflation rate. Would 5.1% increase in the minimum wage do what he says, push up interest rates, inflation, all these things? Inflation is already going up. Right? So the question is, what's the marginal extra impact of that wage rise? And wages are a big part of, of prices in the country. Everybody gets a wage, right? And so the, the question is really minimum wages. Specifically, if you're only targeting that, how many people are really on that minimum wage? And there aren't as many people as you think. A lot of us are on enterprise bargaining agreements, award rates, whatnot. And so it doesn't affect quite as many people. Um, and it affects the people who often are the lowest earners. So I think it's not a bad idea. Which comes from Chris Porter. Chris. Mr Morrison wants me and my contemporaries to downsize and put up to $300,000 in our superannuation. He also wants my son, who's in his late 20s, to use his superannuation to buy his first home. How do we balance the competing needs of downsizers like myself and my husband and first home buyers? As a downsizer, we'd like to get as much as possible for our investment so that we can top up our retirement savings. But I also want my son to be able to buy his first home. There seems to be no simple answer. How do we manage housing stock and housing prices? Yeah, Gigi, is there a simple answer? 
The housing sector has been in strife for years here in Australia, and it's just getting worse now, as you are uh, inferring there. Uh, one of the things I do think is not a bad idea is to take some of the amount of money that we are currently compelled to put into superannuation and actually give it to people's pockets and let them do what they want with it. Let them put it in housing if they like. Let them do something else, particularly if they're young people like your son. I mean, why do we basically force him to save this quantity of money so that he can, when he's 65, look into it and say, oh, okay, well, now I'm rich, when he was struggling for 20 or 30 years. So I would particularly love to see something like like what we have in the U.S., where you don't have to save in a superannuation account a certain amount, but you have the option through a tax-deferred fund or tax-advantaged fund. You can put up to $5,000, let us say, a year. You can do that if you want, but we also have a good sort of age pension type style program that actually helps people starting when they're maybe 60 instead of 67 and is more generous. So that would then allow people to feel like retirees are not going to be struggling, but also have the money in their pockets when they really need it to pay for childcare and housing costs, renting, whatever else, and, you know, have a good life when they're younger. And, uh, you know, and then when they're older, they can still have a good life. So that's what I'd like to see, more equilibrium there. Now, in terms of your downsizing, we hope that, of course, there will be more of those sorts of decisions and releasing the housing stock. One of the problems we have is housing stock. And if uh, Labor's proposal were shifted a bit, maybe they could put the money that they were thinking of uh, sort of co-owning housing uh, with people uh, into, instead into social housing, because we really need more of that for, again, the lower earning people in our society. Well, okay. Well, uh, Peter, Gigi just talked basically about ending compulsory superannuation uh, in, in Australia. That's not something either side of politics is necessarily advocating here, but what do you think? Well, uh, Gigi, I can see you itching to get in here. Uh, look, we know you, you do have strong views about what's happened in the past when it comes to COVID, but we need to acknowledge, as the government regularly reminds us, we still have managed one of the lowest death rates, one of the best performing economies through this pandemic, haven't we? Australia, the lucky country, like yet again. And the luck that we have had in our demography and our geography is what has allowed the major parties to construct the false narrative that what they have done in terms of these incredibly destructive lockdowns has been what has saved us. That's just not true. Um, and I have an analysis out right now that we just released last week, which is a cost-benefit analysis of the lockdown policies and the border closures that were implemented. It's something that the government should have done. I've been calling for the government to do it for two years. The executive summary is downloadable on thegreatcovidpanic.com slash news. And it shows that the the costs of these decisions that were made, but not just by the Commonwealth government, but in many states as well, including here in Melbourne, in Victoria and in Western Australia by the Labour uh, people in charge, have actually cost Australia 30 times or more than they could possibly have delivered in terms of benefits. And so the so benefit of 40,000 lives saved that James Patterson and the government talk yes. about, why is that wrong in your view? It's wrong because it comes from a computer simulation rather than an actual look at the data that we now have. And is yours a computer simulation? No, mine is based on empirical data from around the world, including other places that have not had lockdowns. And I would say, if you just look at what we were being told two years ago, or even a year ago, we had, you know, we were saying, oh, yes, we have to lock down because COVID is a horrible threat. Look at all the infections and deaths. The questioner is correct. The infections and deaths now are astronomically higher, and yet somehow it's basically what's become obvious. It's no longer politically expedient to talk about We're vaccinated now, though, is, is the difference, isn't it? We're vaccinated, and so, uh, we're still dying. So uh, you tell me, that how does that make sense? I mean, I think what's happening is right now we're having the wave that we would have had two years ago. And so, uh, you know, yes, some people have gotten a couple of extra years of life, but we're not going to be, uh, you know, we're just basically having to pay those costs now. And yes, we have some people who are vaccinated. It's lovely we have the vaccine. It's lovely we have early treatments. We have lots of options to deal with it. Uh, we had lots of options even a year ago, including the early treatments. And we have not been focusing on human well-being. If we ever needed proof that the major parties have prioritized political expediency over the welfare of the human population here in Australia. It's been the last two years. And that's why they need to go to the bottom of the ballot. Well, Peter, uh, does Gigi have a point? Well, I'm curious. So the number of people dying now, you're suggesting, would have been... The, the number of deaths is the, is the same if we'd not had the lockdowns. Is that what you're saying? Our best guess is that the number of people's lives saved by the lockdowns is around 10,000. And when I say saved, I mean postponed, right? A death always happens to everyone. The average COVID death, uh, unfortunately, is, is amongst the people who are elderly. So it's usually someone who's over 80 with comorbidities. They have about three to five years of life left to live. 
and we have saved perhaps using you know our analysis which is based on data we have perhaps saved 10,000 people what, well just on that just on that, that don't yeah. you can see that saving 10,000 lives is something that a lot of Australians would think is is probably a good idea yes but this is the question what is the cost of doing that savings does not it count that we have ruined a generation of children's education. We've disrupted children's education for two years, and we've killed our mental health. We have disrupted families. We've crowded out other health care. And our whole point in this cost-benefit analysis is that you cannot just look at benefits. You cannot. That's inhumane. 10,000 10, lives must is, look, a, is you a must pretty look at substantial benefit, though, isn't it? Well, what about 20,000 lives? What about 30,000? Well, that's I pretty mean, substantial, you have too. To, you have to count costs and benefits in the same currency, David. Well, can I ask and a question? Don't, then you are really ignoring the other kinds of suffering that happen directly because of lockdowns. Can I ask a question? Hmm. What is the currency you're using to equate life and death? Yep, great question. Dollars? Great I question. Mean, so there is a whole literature on this, and I'm very happy to share with you the whole cost-benefit analysis. How much which time is do we have? 145 then? pages long. <laughs> no, we don't have much time. So you you have to use currencies which are able to pick up the kinds of damage that have happened, and also the benefits that might have happened, right, from the policy choices. And so we choose two different currencies. Uh, one of them is dollars, and you are able to measure some things in dollars. Mm -hmm. But the more meaningful one is human well-being, and so we okay. use something called the Well-Being Life Year. We're going to. All right, Gigi, what sort of reform would you have liked to have heard from the two? <laughs> oh, boy. I mean, it's been two years of propaganda and, uh, and treating everybody like imbeciles. I think that what we would really like to see is a return to happy, free, joyful Australia, get rid of all the freedom restrictions that we've seen in the last two years, including all the mandates and the coercion and the border closures and the testing and the tracking and the tracing and the masking. All that stuff's got to go. It doesn't help. It doesn't help on net. And so it's not worth it. The government still has not defended it, except by these, you know, 40,000 figures that come out of a computer box. And it hasn't done a cost-benefit analysis. You shouldn't trust them. So I think we should see more freedom. We should see more critical thought. I'd like to see some reform in education. I'd like to see universal basic childcare, And I'd like to see more support for Australia being a strong country that allows its businesses and its people to have freedom and commits to not ever taking it away. Peter Hatcher. <laughs>